Okay, so just to kind of recap that. We're, we're talking about lateral thinking. Lateral thinking is um, what we call divergent thinking or creative thinking. It's thinking outside the box, looking at uh, problems or situations from uh, different perspectives, multiple perspectives, and trying to train ourselves to look at problems um, in a way that we're not habituated to look at them. Okay, because a, 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 a very simple solution might be right, right under your nose, but you don't see it simply because we are always approaching problems in the same way. Okay, and so it's not contradictory to a kind of a logical approach to problems. It is sort of complementary to it. And actually, let me add something there, which is we said, for instance, even when we're talking about inference of the best explanation, once you have, let you say, for instance, uh, my car is not starting or I have a flat tire. Once you have a hypothesis as to why your car is not starting or why you have a flat tire, then you can probe it logically, analytically, scientifically. But arriving at a potential cause of the flat tire or of your car not starting may require some, um, some creative thinking. Um, so we said that, that, there's a, there's, that that's the role of science. That's the role of creativity in science is to be able to look at things in a way that other people do not look at them. That's how you can potentially uh, discover a root cause. That's how you can potentially make a new discovery is by looking at things um, with a certain intellectual perspective, which deviates from your habitual modes of looking at things. Um, so we said sort of the mind is like mud uh, and water goes through the mud and eventually forms these channels and the water then ends up going through nowhere except those pre-carved out grooves. And the same way as like the mind, okay? Um, how we think sort of lays down that intellectual habit and we end up thinking and approaching problems in usually the same repetitive way. Um, and sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. So as I said, he's sort of trying to give us a sort of a method here to sort of dehypnotize ourselves from our own habitual ways of thinking. And this is a quote here. Um, Discovery consists of looking at the same thing as every, everyone else and thinking something different. And that requires that dimension of imagination, creativity, thinking in terms of possibility and thinking in terms of outside the box. Okay, so that's the definition that I, that I want you to retain of lateral thinking. Um, so what we've been doing most of in this class is we've been talking about what you would call vertical thinking. Uh, looking at the truth, looking to see what is the most reasonable theory, what is the most reasonable explanation, uh, looking at things sort of logically, uh, trying to detect errors in thinking, trying to detect fallacies. Uh, lateral thinking is, again, it's not, it's not contradictory to this. It's not like you're doing one or the other. You can combine both of them. Uh, but lateral thinking is, is looking at a problem um, in terms of possibilities, in terms of alternatives, in terms of, as opposed to what is, looking at like what might be, okay? So here's one. Um, this requires both forms of thinking, okay? It requires this kind of logical, critical thinking, that sort of analytical thinking, uh, but it also requires you to deviate from your conventions. Is there, there are several answers to this question. Uh, some of them are obvious, and uh, they jump they jump out at you. But there are other answers to this question that are not so obvious and require, again, uh, that degree of creative, imaginative thinking. Uh, thinking, as I said, uh, thinking against your habitual ways of thinking. So th this is um, this is if I'm not mistaken, this is a question that was asked by. Uh, you know, several tech companies uh, like uh, about, about a decade ago to really see if, if these candidates are thinking, if they can come up with uh, an answer or if they come up with an answer, are they coming up with the, 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 um, the easy answer to this question or are they coming up with uh, a more complicated, okay, uh, and multiple answers to this question? So this is the question, where are you that if you walk one mile south, one mile west, and one mile north, you end up where you started.
Anybody have an answer? So there's actually there's actually a few answers. There are several answers. Um, where are you? Okay, you're on this, the sphere, planet Earth. Where are you that if you walk one mile south, one mile west, and one mile north, you end up where you start? Okay, we'll come back to this uh, because it's not obvious. But once I give you the answer, it's going to be perfectly obvious. And then there are, there are a bunch of other answers that are even more sophisticated. Okay, and when I give you those answers, you're going to say, okay, yeah, I would have not thought of that. And neither would I have thought about, of that. But once you get it, it's, it's, you, you say it's brilliant. Okay, because it is a combination of both the sort of analytical logic, logical kind of thinking with an ability to sort of imagine and entertain e even the answer as being a, pro a, a perspective answer, whereas you might have just ignored it. Yeah, we'll come back to this towards the end here. So these are some simple ones. And uh, maybe you've come across some of these. Um, now, again, you have to look for the answer which is not immediately obvious. If the answer does not jump out at you immediately, then it's not that the problem is difficult, is that, is that you are approaching it. Um, you're not gonna see it because you've already approached it with certain preconceptions and certain ideas that are not there, okay? They're not implied in the problem, but you are creating them for yourselves. And then you're kind of stuck in your own intellectual prison. You can't see beyond uh, the limitations that you yourself have imposed but which aren't there in reality. So very, some of you guys have come across this one, okay? There are six eggs in a basket. Six people each take one egg. How can it be that there's one egg left in the basket? Anybody have a solution to this? How long should I give you here? I don't know. Is this a shot in the dark? Could it be like the last person took uh, the basket with the last egg? Yeah, good, that's very good, okay? So the, the last person, takes their egg, but in the basket. There's nothing, the reason why people do not see this is because they assume that taking an egg requires uh, that it, it has to be taken out of the basket. Uh, no, no, that's not, that's not stated anywhere, anywhere. But once you think that, and you regard that as a basic assumption, you're never gonna get to a very, very simple answer, okay? Uh, they each take one egg. How can it be that one egg is left in the basket? Well, the, the person leaves with the basket with the last egg in it. Okay. This is pretty good because if you don't get it and then I give you the answer, you're going to be, you're going to be disappointed with yourself. Acting on an anonymous phone call, the police raid a house to arrest a suspected murderer. They don't know what he looks like, but they know his name is John. Inside, they find a carpenter, a lorry driver, a car mechanic, and a fireman playing cards. Without even asking his name, they immediately arrest the fireman. How do they know they got their man? Any ideas? And here there are a lot of clues. And does anybody have an answer? And the reason why you don't have an answer is because in some sense, if you don't have the answer, it's gonna be, it's even though the answer is so simple, it's almost gonna be impossible for you to, to get the answer on your own because you've already assumed something which is not necessarily implied. And therefore you've limited um, your sense of possibility here in an unnecessary way. Does anybody have an answer? It's gonna come up in the chat. Hold on. Let me see, I'm stalling here because of the chat. Um, okay, one potential answer is the person has a badge. Um, they arrest the fireman, maybe the fireman has a badge and they see his name or the person, these are people that have sort of name tags. Uh, you might say that's an answer that I've gotten from students in the past. These are people that might have their name tag, you know, on their, on their shirt and that might give them away. Uh, that might be it, but that's not necessarily the best answer. Anybody else? How long should I give you here? I mean, I'm just gonna give you the answer, okay? So, the reason why they arrest John is because John is the only man there. Okay, let me see if it was gonna come up here. He's the only one who's alive. That's another, that's another interesting answer, okay? Um, 
but just because he's the only one who's alive doesn't mean that he's the one that committed the crime. I mean, yeah, yeah, he's the only person that you're going to arrest, especially if there's sort of um, evidence that not only has he is he suspected of a murder somewhere else, but now he's in this room and he's playing cards with three corpses, and there seems to be evidence that he himself killed these other three people. That might do it. Okay, that's pretty creative thinking. But there's a simpler answer here. The simpler answer is he's the only man. Everybody else is a woman. Okay, so it's 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 immediately obvious to the police that he's the man they're looking for because he's the only man there. The only the reason you don't see that as a possibility is because it's sort of rigged in a way. You say, okay, a carpenter, a lorry driver, a car mechanic, a fireman. These are all professions that are normally associated with being. Uh, well, the, 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 these are uh, professions that are normally associated with men. And so you read that and you automatically, you're, 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 you blank out. That's all you see. And when you say that all of these other people are women, the, the answer is completely obvious. Okay. Uh, so he's the only man and all the others are women. Yeah, this is a, you know, you could do this at a, at a bar or something. How can you make, you have three glasses full, three glasses empty. How can you make it so that uh, by only moving one glass, they will be alternating full, empty, full, empty, full, empty. Any ideas? I prefer it if you speak up as opposed to using the chat. Any got anybody got an idea? We can move the second glass and pour it into the fifth one. Yeah, very good. So that's pretty straightforward. Okay. Again, a lot of people, what do you do is you take the content, you lift up the second glass, you're only touching the second glass, you pour the content into the fifth glass, and you put the empty now, the now empty second glass back where it was. A lot of people do not see this because uh moving requires that there has to be a shuffling and the shuffling implies that at least two have to move okay uh in this case you're using uh you're exploiting sort of the 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 liquid quality of the 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 substance here you know uh and why not so you just basically pour the content of the second glass uh into the fifth glass as was stated okay this you're all familiar with this idea of how do you connect these lines uh, using four straight lines. How do you connect these dots using four straight lines and without lifting your pen uh, from, the pap from the paper, okay? So continually like one, two, three, four, you're gonna be missing one, okay? And these are like one, two, three, I don't know, like four, you're missing one or two. You're always gonna be missing one or two. So um, anybody, anybody got any ideas here? No, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that one as well, okay? So again, what is lateral thinking? Lateral thinking is um, problem solving. And it's, it's, a, in a, it's an approach of looking at a specific scenario, um, not only with reason, um, but looking, trying to look at things from a perspective that you're not taking for granted. It's not the immediately obvious. Okay, using reasoning that is not immediately obvious. Okay, we are not necessarily following a kind of a protocol step by step procedure. And uh, again, this is quite good in shifting away from your habitual thinking patterns that are, as he describes, deeply entrenched and predictable to try to seek out new and unexpected approaches to problems and new and unexpected ideas. So he gives us these six thinking hats. Um, Every hat gives us, basically, he says, you have to take the time necessary to look at the situation or look at the problem from each of these perspectives. And so you're you are necessarily going through a kind of a checklist. Uh, and it's a checklist that requires you to, to take at least some time to look at it from some perspective that you would not habitually be likely to, to do. Um, so let's say if you are, you could be, let's say optimistic, you can be pessimistic. If you're always looking at things from a pessimistic or a conservative or cautious lens, then there are things that you don't see. So he's sort of asking you, he's forcing you to consider the, even the, the, um, the perspectives that you're not habitually good at using. And similarly, if you're always optimistic, you see how both of these in isolation can, can backfire. 
if you're always cautious and you're always pessimistic, then you're not going to see the things that would enable you to act in the situation. And vice versa, if you're always optimistic, if you're always wearing what he calls the yellow hat, then you're not going to see, um, you're not going to assess the situation correctly. And you may end up in a very bad situation. Okay. Um, so what are these six thinking hats? The first one is basically the white hat. And he says, you have to take some time to focus on getting the information, okay, getting the data, um, learning about the situation, learning what information is relevant and so on. So basically, this is taking the time to actually get the facts. So I don't know, let's say you're buying a car. This would be your sort of fact spreadsheet. Okay, how much is it going to cost me? How much is insurance going to cost me? How much is uh, how, more, how much are my monthly payments going to cost me? Um, how much is it going to cost me on gas and so on? Okay, so the facts, so kind of a cross comparison of simply the facts. That would be the white hat, and this can also be sort of looking at past historical trends, uh, sort of an analysis of past trends, extrapolating from historical data. That's the white hat. Okay, it's sort of very um, analytical. The white hat. Then the red hat, the red hat is uh, the emotional. How does this, um, what is your, what is your gut feeling tell you? Okay. What are your instincts telling you? Um, again, that seems to be a little bit different from the white hat. If you're always sort of on acting on impulse, if you're always acting on your gut reaction and your feelings, then you are avoiding all of the data, which may help you make a better decision in, in terms of the white hat. But if you're always wearing the white hat, and you're not at one point, you know, feeling the situation, you're not using your intuition, then you might also end up um, missing some potentially interesting solutions. Um, so let's say one would be the white hat would be sort of logical and the red hat would be sort of the emotional. So sort of gut reaction, intuition, emotion. So taking the time to ask yourself, well, how do I feel about the situation? Okay. Um, you know, I know that it's good. I know that it makes sense. I know it might be a good investment, but something, something is telling me that something is off. Okay. So if something, if, if that's something, then go, go into the black hat and look at things more cautiously. Okay. So a white hat, red hat, the black hat is, um, looking at all the bad points. Okay. We generally, that's kind of confirmation bias and wishful thinking. We generally have a tendency to look at things. Uh, especially things that, that we like, we, we want them to be pleasant. Okay. We, you know, you're, e you're, you're, you're eager and you're excited to, let's say, buy a new car. And so you, you, you may sort of deceive yourself by not being willing to look at the things which might give you a reason as to why you shouldn't buy this car. Maybe you should buy another model. Okay. So the black hat is sort of like, I guess the pros and cons. Okay. The black hat would be listing the, the cons and the yellow hat would be listing the pros. And you see how both of them have their advantages and their disadvantages. Um, let's say um, the black hat is, if you're only wearing the black hat, then you might miss some good opportunities because you've only focused on the negative. And there are some people that are like that, okay? Uh, they're not necessarily bad. Sometimes they're good to have around because they're going to show you things about a specific situation or a specific person, a purpose that you might not see because you're blinded by your optimism. Uh, you know, let's say if you're if you're overly optimistic, you can also be taken advantage of by let's say a con artist and so on because you really want to believe uh, that what he has to say and what he has to sell you is is beautiful and it's positive and it's good, and you are therefore undermining or the unconsciously avoiding. Um, the, the work of the black hat, okay? So um, that's, I think, the least you can do when you're making a complicated decision is have this sort of um, paper in front of you with the pros and the cons, the black hat and the yellow hat. But there are other things to consider, okay? Um, so the yellow hat is sort of the, the, the looking at the benefits, looking at the values, looking at the situation Opti um, optimistically. And again, if you're always in the, this position, it may not necessarily be in your best interest. Uh, so the green hat is also very interesting. This would be sort of the, the, the lateral thinking hat, which is I'm shopping for a car. What are the facts? 
How much is it going to cost me? My gut reaction would be sort of that's the red hat now is my gut reaction tells me uh, this car is better than that car. The black hat is telling me that these are all the negative points of the car. The white hat, the yellow hat is telling me that these are the positive points of the car. And then you put on the green hat and you say, well, what do I need this car for? Do I even need a car? Um, you know, what if I, let's say, take the, uh, use the bike? Or what if I take the bus for a year? And uh, maybe, you know, you, maybe you haven't even thought about taking the bus. And then you look at taking the bus and you realize, that, you know what, it might even be better because I won't have to, you know, uh, finance this car. I won't have to worry about parking. I won't have to worry about parking tickets and all this stuff. So you say, well, actually, you know what? There's this alternative that I didn't consider at all because I was sort of hypnotized into the idea that I have to buy a car. And the green hat might show that to you, okay? So the green hat is sort of the creativity aspect. It's uh, what you call sort of the brainstorming, looking at things. Um, considering considering possibilities and scenarios that uh, you, you might have not considered. And then lastly, the blue hat. The blue hat is basically, you have to, having done this process, you have to draw some conclusions. There has to be some sort of, having done this sort of analysis, this thinking and looking at the thing from different perspectives, you know, good, bad, emotional, logical, creative, then the blue hat is, okay, now um, practically, what can you do, okay? Practically, how do I, what, what's the next step here? Procedurally, blue hat is sort of procedural, okay? Um, having done this analysis, do I now buy the car? Do I now go home? Do I now go buy a bicycle? Do I now go to another dealership and start the whole process all over again? The blue hat is um, basically, how does this information and this analysis translate over to a practical action that moves the process along, okay? So that we eventually, uh, after having put on the blue hat a few times, you get to a conclusion and you, either, you have either bought a car or you haven't bought a car and you're done looking. You know what I mean? So that's the blue hat. So let's come back to this. How do we connect these dots? Let me see if I can, if I have to draw this. But no, I guess sort of, let me just follow the, follow this little mouse of mine here is we have, you cannot connect the dots with four connected lines without lifting off the paper because you, you've, you've in some sense, you've turned, this into a, you've turned this into a square. You created a perimeter, a boundary around this where that you feel that you cannot go past. And precisely because you're operating in this fictitious boundary around these nine dots, uh, that you are limited. And it's a limit which is completely self-imposed by your own thinking, that it is not implied in anything that is written here or in the rules at all. So a very simple solution is basically like this, is you go beyond, you literally think outside the box in this case, because you are putting this inside of an arbitrary make-believe box, which doesn't exist. And nobody says it has to exist. So you start here, you go to the top corner, you go past the last dot here, you go past it. So you come back at, a, at an angle this way, and then again, you go past and you come back to the year and you've connected. I mean, you can, you can start with any corner and do the same thing and you'll, you'll connect all the dots. But that's not the only way, okay? All the permutations of this one is you can say, for instance, well, suppose these dots have a width to them. Then I can take a, a line arbitrarily thin and let's say my dots are, let's say, this big. You know, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I can take a line and I can start, you know, 15 meters away and I can come in at a very, very shallow angle and I can hit the first three dots. And then I can, go no, I can go another 15 meters, turn back at another very, very shallow angle. And that line comes across and cuts these three dots. And then again, I turn back again, 15 meters away and I come back at a very, very shallow angle so that they're almost in parallel, you see? They're not quite parallel because there's an angle there further down, but I'm coming at such a, 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 a slow angle, uh, a shallow angle that when I'm hitting the dots, I've used now three lines. I've actually saved one line. Um, and I have basically three lines that are virtually in parallel, even though they're not, okay? So that I've respected the rule that these have to be three interconnected lines. Or you can, um, you know, if you say, well, 
what do we, how do we define a line? Are we talking about a line as being sort of in the mathematical sense as having sort of no width to it? Or are we talking about, let's say a line like a, a line on a, an airport um, runway? Some of those lines are, you know, pretty thick painted lines. So why don't we use one of those? And with one swoop of one of those lines, then I, I only need one line because all my dots now fit into it. Okay, now we're being very creative, you see. Um, or let's say if the, if the dots were on a piece of paper, then you can take the piece of paper and um, fold it onto itself. And folding it onto itself, you know, you can draw one thick line right through them, or you can do something like this. You know, you can turn the piece of paper into a cone and you have a line that ends up making a spiral. And again, you have the same effect of basically having these parallel lines, but these parallel lines are basically in, in, con in continuity. They're the same line, just basically spinning back onto itself and hitting the, hitting the, the three rows of, um, of dots uh, in every subsequent loop around. Or you can take the sort of brute force approach, which is, you know, I'm tired of playing games, is you just cut out the lines, you rearrange them, and then you draw a line right through, okay? So that's another way to proceed. Um, let me see, hold on. Let me see if I have uh, had a few more good examples. Let me give you two more little, little problems here and then we'll consider this one. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me give you these two. Actually, there's three of them. Um, the first one is, the first one is the more complicated one. Um, how do you add all the numbers from one to a hundred so that you can get the answer very, very quickly? And it's basically, how do you approach the problem? If you approach the problem by saying, okay, let me pull out my calculator and I'm gonna do one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven until I get to a hundred. That's one way to do it because you're looking at the problem in a certain way. And that's, how, that's the way the problem appears to you. But you can look at the problem from a different way. And all of a sudden, the answer becomes completely clear. Okay, so let me give you the problems and then I'll come back and I'll give you the answer. So the first question is, can you find an efficient way to add all the numbers between one and 100? And what would your answer be? Okay, that's the first one. Um, Which one do, should I use? Okay, let me just use the ones that are, that are actually I have another one now. Um, okay, let me give you all of them. Uh, this other one is you're driving and it's a rainy night and you're driving a car. It's a small car, you can only fit one passenger in it. And it's a rainy night and you drive past um, a bus stop and there are three people. Okay, there's, let's say the woman of your dreams. There's an old woman who's about to die that needs to go to the hospital. And there's uh, your best friend there who once saved your life. So how do you deal with that situation? Uh, the, uh, what, what do you do in that situation? And so th the idea there is who do you pick up? But is that the correct way of seeing the problem? So and again, it's a rainy night. You are driving a car that only has one passenger seat in it, um, and you pass by these three people, okay? Your soulmate that you've never met until now, an old woman who's about to die and that needs to go to the hospital, or your best friend that once saved your life. Uh, they're all in need, so what do you do with that situation? So that's the question. I'll come back to it. Now there's two more. This one is, why do... No, let me see how to formulate it. Let me, let me I have just, the answer for this one. Yeah, go ahead. For the last one? Yeah. About yeah. The, the three people. Well, you get off the car and you stay yeah. with your soulmate and then you let your best friend uh, drive uh, the old lady. Yeah, the very good. Yeah, exactly. That's, see, that, that's, an, that's an optimal answer. And it's an optimal answer that requires you to um, go past the assumption that imprisons most people is that basically you can only pick up one person. No, you yourself can also get out of the car and then you have like sort of hero points for your soulmate 
while your best friend gets out of the rain and he's able to simultaneously save the old lady. So it's it's a win-win-win scenario. So very good. That's the answer for that one. Um, let me just give you this other one. It says basically sewers used to be square. They used to be either square or rectangular. And then they decided to turn sewer covers circular. Now, why is that? Anybody have an idea as to why that is? No? So let, let, does anybody have an answer for the first one that I gave you? The, the one about uh, adding all the numbers from one to 100, does anybody have an answer for me or a solution? One thing you can do is this, okay? And I'm not gonna draw it. It's, it's easier with a sort of a visual uh, diagram, but you don't need a visual diagram because it's fairly straightforward to answer. It's basically, you take both extremes and you add them together and you, you work your way towards the middle. So you add one to 100. You add two to 99, three to 98, uh, four to 97, and you work your way down, okay? And what you're gonna get is this. Each of those are worth the same, okay? One plus 100 is 101. Two plus 99 is 101. Three plus 98 is 101. Four plus 97 is 101. So you can assume that they're all 101. And how many of those are you gonna have? You're gonna have 50 because you're gonna get to 50, and 51, and that's gonna be your last one. So you can have 50 times, 50 times 101. So what does that give you? You can almost do it in your head, okay? It should give you 5,050, which is the answer if you add all the numbers from one to 100. But you do it a lot faster. You do it a lot faster because you've rearranged the problem. You've looked at, you've structured the problem in a different way that is not obvious to you. So there's actually a story about this. It, go, it comes from a um, um, famous uh, mathematician, Gauss, who was a sort of a maverick as a student. And the, the legend has it that his school teacher, I don't know, wanted to read the newspaper or something like that. So he told the kids, okay, here's your problem. Give me the answer for all the numbers added from one to 100. And he was gonna assume that the kids were gonna do this addition and it was gonna take them a few minutes and you know he can drink his coffee or whatever. And Gauss, as soon as he, as soon as the, the teacher sat down, uh, Gauss, you know, the famous uh, bell curve that uh, you guys get your uh, R score on, um, the Gauss, the bell curve. But basically, as soon as the teacher sat down, he says, I have an answer. The answer is 5,050. And he was able to arrive at the answer so quickly because, well, he's obviously a genius. Uh, to be able to imagine how to restructure the problem that way. But he's not a genius there because he's mathematically proficient, he is, but he's also a genius because he's able to restructure the mathematics in a way that is, is sort of visually immediately obvious what the answer is, okay? If you, if you add the extremes and you work your way in, at the extremity, you get one plus 100. And as you move towards the center, the last one that you get is 50 plus, plus 51. So it's 50 times 101 is 5,050. The answer jumps out immediately at you. Um, now let's just go with the last one, okay? Does anybody have an answer for the last one? Why are sewer covers round? And there's an, inter there's an interesting answer there, which makes perfect sense, but you don't think about it until, until it, it, it clicks, okay? Which is back in the day, what they realized was, let's say you have city workers that are gonna take the sewer cap off, the square sewer cap off, and they're gonna put it on the sign. What happened on some occasions is while the person is down there in the sewer, um, the person, you know, the, the sewer cap falls in and a square cover or a rectangular cover can be reoriented. I can pick it up and reorient it like this so that it'll drop straight down into the hole and it'll bash the person's skull, okay? But a round sewer cover, no matter how I orient it, will never fall into its own hole because the diameter, the, the cross diameter there of that circle, no matter how I orient it, that diameter is always there. So it's always gonna block at least on one line. Even if I take the, 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 the circle disc and I flip it like this to drop down like this, it's still gonna hit the edges, okay? The edges, that diameter, there's no, there's no orienting of the circle that is going to reduce its, 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 its diameter. Uh, so 
basically the sewer cover that is round is a lot safer because you cannot accidentally, you know, re reorient it so that it'll drop down and potentially kill the person who's working down there. So there's actually a kind of a safety reason for something like that, a kind of a design feature that went unnoticed for so long. And then once you notice it, you make this realization. It's such a simple thing that was right under our, right under our nose that we didn't see. Okay. Um, so now let's come back to this one. Does anybody have an answer to this? Where would you be on planet Earth that if you walked one mile south, one mile west, and one mile north, you would end up where you started? There's, there's an, there's, it's not a, it's not an obvious answer, but it's a fairly simple answer. Has anybody got an answer? No. Well. One answer is the North Pole. Because anywhere else where you are, suppose, supposing you, let's say you're at the equator, around the equator. If you walk one mile south, one mile west, and one mile north, then you're not where you started. You're about a mile from where you started, pretty much exactly a mile from where you started. But if you're at the North Pole, then what happens? Okay, You are exploiting the curvature of the Earth. So you're going to go one mile south. Okay, one mile west is you're walking now around the North Pole to this side, and one mile north brings you back to the North Pole. So you end up walking in a kind of a curved triangle, if that makes sense. You're basically walking in a triangle, approximately. You're walking in a kind of a triangle like this. Okay, um, that's one solution. One solution that I came up with, which is not a practical solution, but it's, I guess it still works as a solution, is if you're right at the center of the Earth. I, I guess this is satisfied, okay? Because if you go one mile south, you're going straight to the South Pole along the axis of spin of the Earth. Then one mile west is meaningless because you are in the you're in that axis of spin. So west, uh, east, and west is sort of meaningless. So the one mile west is sort of annihilated, and then you go back one mile north. It's like an elevator. You know what I mean? You go one mile south towards the South Pole. One mile more, but I mean, that, that, that's obviously not practically feasible. Another student, some other students in another class say that, let's say you do this on a windy sea. So that while, while you're traveling, let's say a, a strong east, easternly wind on an open sea, you travel one mile south, you're traveling one mile south, but you're drifting east. And then you travel one mile uh, west. So you counter, um, the eastern wind, and you're also going a little bit further so that you're also going to be countering the eastern wind that's going to be making you drift as you're going back one mile north, okay? So presumably, you have to get an easterly wind that's just strong enough so that as you're going one mile south, it's making you drift eastward about a half a mile, and then you go one mile west, you overcompensate. So now you're actually half a mile east, half a mile west. And then as you're going one mile north, the wind makes you drift another half a mile east and you end up where you started, okay? But that's not the best answer. The, the best answer that I've ever come across is you can also do this, if I'm not mistaken, along, there's an infinite number of points in and around, not in, but around the South Pole, which satisfy this problem. Okay, so suppose you start, you are around the South Pole and you start, I don't know where it would be, okay? I didn't do the math, but basically you're going to start, it's going to be like one point something miles away from the South Pole. So that when you travel one mile south, you're heading now traveling towards the South Pole. You don't reach the South Pole. Where you reach is basically where you, you reach the point where there is a one mile circumference around the South Pole. So you understand? So basically you're coming down towards the South Pole, you reach a circumference, which is itself one mile round and it goes round the South Pole. So what will that look like? Is you're going to go down one mile, you're going to, be, you're going to go west one mile walking around the South Pole. You're gonna basically go around the South Pole 360 degrees. And then you go back one mile north and you end up where you started. So anywhere 
that is one mile north. Yes, anywhere that is one mile north of that loop, which is itself one mile in circumference around the South Pole will satisfy this, okay? And you can go even further. You can say, for instance, you can do any multiple of, um, of a mile. So you can say, let's say, I can go to uh, the half mile point. And what is that gonna do is I'm gonna go south one mile. And if the circumference now is a half mile loop around the South Pole, then going one mile west means I go around that loop twice. And then I start where I end up where I started. I go one mile north and I'm back where I started. And you can do that for any circumference around the South Pole. So there are infinite number of circumferences, potential loops around the South Pole. So you can do that at the circumference, which is, let's say, a third of a mile or a quarter of a mile. So if I go down one mile south to this loop, which is a quarter mile walk around the South Pole, then going west, one mile west is means I'm going to go around that loop one, two quarter mile, two, two quarter miles, three quarter miles, four quarter miles. I'm back where I started. I go one mile north. I'm back where I started. So around the South Pole, there's an infinite number of sets which satisfy uh, th this this ladder. So that one's really uh, that one's really good. Okay, that that last answer is really good. You see that it combines the sort of analytical, logical, mathematical with that element of creativity, which which does require that you you are looking at this problem from from a kind of a special perspective. Okay, that basically most people are blind to it and they may never come across that solution ever. Okay. So that is lateral thinking, okay? Uh, I want you to retain a definition of lateral thinking and I want you to retain uh, those six thinking hats. Um, any questions or comments with regards to that? No? Okay, so let's just sort of conclude here, conclude a few concluding uh, remarks for the semester and then uh, we'll be done here. Let me stop this.